QuickBooks Online 2024 Balance Sheet Report Overview. Get ready and some trail mix because we're hiking on QuickBooks Online, our audit trail to success. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head, allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the Matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey's saying. So get one, because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are online in our browser, searching for QuickBooks Online Test Drive, looking for the result that has Intuit.com in the URL, Intuit being the owner of QuickBooks, selecting the United States version of the software and verifying that we're not a robot. We're gonna be opening up the reports like we do every time, the major two financial statement reports on the report's left-hand side and then we'll be right clicking on the balance sheet in the favorite reports. Open link in new tab. Right click on the profit and loss report. Open link in new tab. Let's go up to that tab up top that we just opened in the middle. Closing up the hamburger, this is our balance sheet. We'll do a range change up top, bringing it back to 2023. 010123 tab, 123123 tab. Run it to refresh it. Tab it to the right, closing up the hamburger, scrolling up and changing that range. 010123 tab, 123123 and tab. Run it to refresh it. So we're going to go back to the balance sheet. That's going to be our point of focus this time. Noting the major two financial statements. Once again, balance sheet and the income st statement which QuickBooks generally calls the profit and loss statement. So we'll do some kind of accounting standpoint here to think about these two reports and why they are so important. And then we'll also think about it in terms of QuickBooks in that we'll see how QuickBooks is used to make financial statements to generate uh, these reports. So the general idea of the bookkeeping process, what we're doing as the bookkeeper, two main goals. One is that we're trying to create the financial statements from the data inputs, balance sheet, income statement, and related reports. And number two, we're trying to facilitate the transactions so we can communicate well with the people we're involved with, which includes the customers, vendors, and employees. So we wanna make the transactions as smooth as possible, but we're creating the balance sheet and the income statement for internal use possibly, for tax preparation possibly by the end of the year that we're gonna need at least the income statement for and maybe for external users like the bank that might need financial information if we want like a loan uh, or something like that. So the balance sheet then of these two reports is gonna be the report that shows where we stand as of a point in time. And the income statement then is gonna be the report that gives us detail about how we are doing or what our performance was over a time frame. So the first thing we wanna realize is that on the balance sheet, if we just have a normal balance sheet, we only really need one date. So this is as of December 31st, 2023. You can see we still put a range in here. You might be asking, why do I put a range in QuickBooks? Why doesn't it just ask me for one date? 
Well, one reason for that is that the drill down function, when I drill down into a particular account, such as the checking account, then we get a report that is in a range feature, this being the transaction report that gives us that whole year's worth of data within it. So by putting a range into the balance sheet, it won't change the actual balance sheet, but it will give us some detail when we go into the transaction detail reports so that we don't have to then change the range once we're in here, which is nice. Let's go back to the balance sheet. In other words, if I was to change this, if I, if I look at these numbers, 2001, 5281, and so on, if I change this to like the beginning date as of 06, uh, 3, and run it, we get the same numbers, 2001, 5281. If I change it even to 1231, 123, there's no distance between these two dates. We get the same numbers here. It's just that when I drill down on the data, then I have to then adjust the range because now, now there's nothing in this report, which is a range report as opposed to a point in time report. So let's go back and we'll say starting over from 010123 uh, and running this again. So every transaction that we put in play from this plus button will have an impact on at least two accounts. One of them is going to be a balance sheet or could be two balance sheet accounts, but two accounts on the balance sheet and income statement. Every journal entry that we make, that will be the double entry accounting system. Now the balance sheet, if I close up all the triangles, we can see that we have assets, liabilities, and equity. They equal each other. That's the accounting equation. Assets equal liabilities plus equity. And now you can think about that like a couple different ways. So we might say, what is the balance sheet? That's what the company has and who they owe the stuff to. So in other words, whatever the company has are the assets. We don't report the assets just as cash. Uh, be, well, they don't just have cash. They have any other types of assets, equipment, inventory, and whatnot. But we have to value it in terms of dollars. Dollars are our measuring tool. And then the other side, the liabilities and equity, is who has claim to the assets. So the assets would be the value of the company, in essence, if there were no liabilities and equity, right? That's, um, that's what the stuff that we have reported in dollar terms. And then the liabilities and equity is kind of the other half of the coin. It represents who has claim to the stuff. So that doesn't mean that we can really just give out 23,436 to the liabilities and the equity people because we don't actually have that money, right? What we have is a bunch of stuff, usually property, plants, and equipment inventory that we're valuing at 23,436. So, but the idea would be if I actually sold all of that stuff and I was able to receive the dollar amount that it's on the books for, then I would have the 23,436 and I can pay it out to who I owe it to, which would be third party liabilities and the equity in accordance who, with whoever I owe it. That would happen on a liquidation when you close a company, right? You'd have to sell everything to get the money and then pay off your liabilities and then the equity. Liabilities represent third party people, such as the bank or possibly accounts payable uh, that you owe money to. So, and then the equity represents the owner. Equity is often confusing for people because there's different like uh, business types or entities that could name equity different things. So for example, if you're a sole proprietorship, the equity is just the owner's equity. That's the easiest scenario because that means that all of the equity is yours, right? So you can also think of it as assets minus liabilities equals the equity, which would be like the book value of the company that if you were only had one owner, sole proprietor would be yours. But if you're a partnership, then you have partner's equity. You can still think about the equity as though all of the equity is the owner's claims to the assets, but in a partnership, of course, multiple partners have to then break up that ownership and say how much of that uh, equity is per partner. And that actually becomes fairly complex in a partnership, possibly even more complex than a corporation, whether it be a C corporation or an S corporation, uh, will have then the equity is going to be stockholders equity. 
And the reason that's actually a little bit easier oftentimes than a partnership is because the idea of stockholders is that we're going to have all that lump sum in equity, meaning owner's claim to the assets. And, and then instead of us putting capital accounts for each partner, each owner of the business, we're just going to issue shares and the shares will be equal units and whatnot. And so therefore, when we track it, the bookkeeping, I can just put everything into the retained earnings account or the equity account in essence. And then, and then who has claim to that will be dependent upon the shares, which will all be equal units basically of ownership in the entity. So, but that's the general idea. So if I open this back up, just to drill this down a little bit further, if we say now we see the assets and here's the liabilities and equity. So a lot of finance people will see this equation as 23, 436.29 assets minus the liabilities. 31097.33, there's actually a negative equity, uh, which isn't good, <laughs> of 7,661. That, that means the owners actually owe the company money, basically, right? So usually, hopefully, you want to have a positive equity, uh, tip, typically. But in any case, that, that then equity would be like the book value of the business, right? That would be the, the value of the business owned to the, to the shareholders. As accountants, we typically see the equation as assets equal liabilities plus equity rather than assets minus liabilities equals equity. Because from an accounting standpoint, you've got, you've got this is basically your double ledger, your double entry accounting, meaning you've got your assets on one side of the coin and then who has claims to the assets, third party people, liabilities, or the owner's equity. All right, let's go through each of these line items then. So I'm going to try to close everything up here on the asset side, and we'll just go through what is in the asset. So we've got uh, total assets. The asset account is a standard financial reporting term. So when you have external financial reportings of the balance sheet, you of course will have the first section of the balance sheet being assets. Current assets, also a financial accounting term. So we, so those are going to be assets that are going to be uh, more liquid assets, meaning they're more likely to be converted to cash or used up in a short period of time. And then if I open that up and I've closed these triangles, now we have the bank accounts, accounts receivable, and other current assets. These three are tying out to account types and are kind of more tied into instead of external financial reporting best practices type things, they're tied into what QuickBooks needs uh, to report the accounts as because each of these different account types have different needs. To see that, let's go to the first tab and then I'm going to go down to the uh, transactions tab and then I'm going to close the hand boogie and go on over to the chart of accounts. So in the chart of accounts, we can see the account types that are going to be set up here. So we have bank accounts, accounts receivable, other current assets. We saw this when we looked at the general ledger. These accounts are going to have specific needs within QuickBooks. So when I set up a new account, if I went to the setting up of a, of a, of a new account and new up top, then I would choose the type of account that we're going to be setting up up top. So the question we might ask from from an, a general reporting standpoint is why don't I call of all all of these stuff should just be called current assets, right from just an external reporting standpoint. But from QuickBooks standpoint, it's saying, hey, look, this one has to be something other than just generic current asset, because I want to make the bank accounts be able to connect to the financial institutions, therefore, they they need their other uh, their own category, instead of just instead of just a current asset account. So that's why everything that has its own category is going to end up with a drop down when you get into the financial statements. So now you've got the bank accounts. If you're looking at normal balance sheet reporting, you probably wouldn't call it bank accounts, right? You would call it uh, you would call it just cash and cash equivalents. But here in QuickBooks, they want to call it the bank accounts because those are the ones that connect to the financial statement, which is useful for internal bookkeeping purposes, right? And then, so then you've got the total bank accounts here on the sub account and then accounts receivable has the same thing. 
Why don't we just call it like we would for normal external reporting purposes, a current asset account? Well, it is a current asset, but it has its own category, its own GL account type uh, that's more detailed than current assets because QuickBooks wants to make sure that the accounts receivable has special uh, things tied to it, which include the ability to track to a subledger and accounts receivable will be restricted from reporting anything to that account that doesn't have a customer related to it so that you can track it out to a subledger. So uh, as we look at these, you can also think about the other reports that will be involved with it. With the checking accounts, we'll have the statement of cash flows, which will ultimately tie out to the cash accounts. And then we also have uh, the you know deposit uh, registers and check registers that will tie out to the checking account and so on. With accounts receivable, we're going to have the added reports that we saw over here. Let's right click and duplicate another one and say that uh, if I go into the reports on the left hand side, the accounts receivable will be the major account that have sub reports on who owes you money of that category of reports are usually going to be tying into the accounts receivable because we need a sub ledger by customer. And then we've got the uh, other current, and by the way, if I go into the checking account here, just to look at each of these, the checking account is gonna have mo more types of transactions than any other account. So that's because the checking account is the lifeblood of the company. Uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the oil that, that is going through all of the machine of the accounting, and therefore it's gonna have more transaction types and more transactions within it typically than any other account. If you go into an accounts receivable account, then you're only gonna be seeing increases with invoices and decreases with the payments on the invoices. It should be very strict in terms of the forms that you're gonna see within it. And you're only gonna have accounts receivable on the books if you're using an accrual based accounting system, meaning you're billing people with invoices instead of using sales receipts or deposit forms to record your revenue. And then in other current assets, we've got the uh, everything else that is a current asset, in this case, inventory. Now you might think that inventory should have a special account for itself because it also has a sub ledger similar to the accounts receivable. But even if you're tracking inventory perpetually within the QuickBooks system, QuickBooks isn't forcing you to record an item every time you record something to the inventory. Whereas with accounts receivable, they are restricting you from recording whenever you record something to accounts receivable to have a customer. So I think that's why QuickBooks doesn't need an added or special kind of account category for inventory. It's gonna act just like an other current asset account, even though it's gonna have a sub ledger if you're tracking inventory on a perpetual inventory method, the subledger tying into the inventory asset account in dollar amount, that's what it's in here, also tracking the units of inventory. And then we've got the undeposited funds. This is that account that we use as an intermediary account so that we can then uh, put the money in here and then deposit it into the checking account. Why do we do that? Because we might have payments from credit card companies or payments that we have received from cash. And then we need to group those payments that we have received together. And then we want to deposit them into the checking account in the same format, the same grouping as will be on the bank feeds. So that uh, when we do the bank reconciliations, we, have, we can easily match out our deposit side to what's on uh, the bank side of things. So we, that's the use of the undeposited funds. Sometimes you might not need undeposited funds. If you have a simple system, then you might be able to deposit directly into the checking account. But if you're getting paid with credit cards and, or you're having multiple cash transactions at a cash register, it's likely that you're gonna to wanna to use undeposited funds so that you can group your deposits in the same way that, as they'll appear on the bank account. Now also realize you might be saying, well, undeposited funds then is like a cash account. It represents cash that we have or have claim to at least with a credit card or with the cash, actual physical cash that hasn't yet been deposited into the bank. So from normal accounting standpoint, you would think it would be up here under the category that wouldn't normally be called bank accounts, but rather cash and cash equivalents. That's where it should be, right? But again, QuickBooks from a 
from an internal uh, software standpoint, I believe the reason would be is that the undeposited funds doesn't act like a checking account because they don't want you to tie the undeposited funds to the to like a to like a bank feeds. It has its a different use for it, and therefore they put it down here into other current assets. A little bit confusing, but it should clear out to zero. And when it clears out to zero, it will then be moved up here. Also note that if you look at your statement of cash flows and you're trying to tie out the statement of cash flows to your assets, you gotta, if there's something in undeposited funds, it's gonna be included in that bank account total. So just be aware of that. So then if we go down to, by the way, the inventory, as we saw, uh, goes up when we purchase inventory and then it's going to and then it's going to go down purchase with a check or a bill and it's going to go down when we sell inventory either with an invoice or a sales receipt and then the undeposited funds if we go into it what's going to happen with the journal entries related to it it's going to be going up when we when we uh, receive a payment on an invoice or enter a sales receipt and then it's going to be going down when we make the deposit and the deposit group them together and deposit it into the checking account typically then we have the fixed assets so now we're on the fixed assets now fixed assets is often a point of confusing for a lot of people because a lot of times people in small businesses particularly might say hey look i just want to be on a cash-based system i just want to record my outflows when they happen when they uh, clear the bank but if you're in the united states you're at least going to have to do tax you're going to have to do taxes and you're going to have to deal with large purchases which are going to have to have an accrual component to it meaning you're going to have to put it on the books as an asset the tax code will force you to do it even if you don't want to do it uh, yourself and the general idea would be if you purchase something large and the example the extreme example would be like a building if you paid $100,000 for a building, even if it was cash, if you, if you put it on the books as an expense, what's going to happen is when you compare one period to the next, like I bought a $100,000 building in January and in February I didn't, then you're going to have this huge loss in January when you compare to February and it'll look like you had a horrible January because you got this big loss, but that's not really what happened because you purchased a building that's actually going to benefit you for 30 years. So that comparison problem is why the accrual method differs oftentimes from the cash method. So that example being so extreme that even if you're on a cash based system, you're going to have to put like a building and large purchases on the books as an asset doing an accrual thing to them and then expensing them in the form of uh, depreciation. This is also a, a different kind of field as well because you don't always purchase uh, equipment. It's not something that happens all the time. Therefore, there's no form up top here specifically designed for the purchase of equipment. You could use an expense form if you paid cash for it, for example, but uh, you might have financed the equipment, in which case there's no form for it generally because we don't purchase equipment on a fixed basis. We don't, it's not something we do in our normal cycle. It's something we do very less often periodically. And so that's another thing that kind of throws people off sometimes. And if you're using bank feeds to decrease your checking account and record your expenses, if you have a large purchase, then that might be something that you have to put on the books as an asset. And you can have questions in terms of, for example, if I'm buying stuff from the same place, an office warehouse store or something like that, most of the time they will be expenses. But if I buy some large piece of equipment from that same office warehouse store and I'm using bank feeds, then I have to know that, okay, wait a second, that large piece of equipment, I'm gonna have to put on the books as an asset and not expense it. So we'll talk about that uh, more in future presentations. And then if we add those all up, of course, this is the total current assets. And then the current assets, the fixed assets, the cash gets us to the total assets of the 23, 4, 36, 29. Liabilities and equities. Let's first take a look at the liabilities. So I'm going to close up the equity. Duh, duh, and duh. Okay, so the, the liabilities has an has the liabilities term is a normal external 
reporting term uh, that that is general, right? And then you've got the current liabilities, also a normal balance sheet reporting category representing those liabilities, liabilities, what you owe to third parties, these current ones being those that are going to be due within a year. So you've got the current liabilities. Then you've got this other sub account thing here, which once again, is a little bit strange because these categories tie out to the different types of accounts that have been set up. And you might say, well, why do I have accounts payable with this drop down? It should just be called an, a, a current liability. Well, the same reason they did it for the accounts receivable. When we set up the chart of accounts down here, they have its own account type. Why do they have its own account type? Because accounts payable needs a special purpose of being able to track the liability by vendor, the sub ledger. Once again, QuickBooks will force you to add a vendor every time you post something to accounts payable. Therefore, it has its own category and everything that has its own category has its own little triangle drop down here. So if I go into accounts payable, this is also an accrual type of account. And therefore, it's only going to go up if you're entering bills when you make your expense payments, as opposed to using an expense form or check form. And it's going to go down when you pay down the bill with a bill payment type of check form decreasing the checking account, decreasing the accounts payable. So there's going to be that one. And then let's close up the rest of these for now. Then we have the credit card. So the credit card is going to have its own special account. Again, why don't we just call it an other current uh, liability? That's what it normally would be in external reporting purposes because it has its own special need because the credit card could be connected to a bank feed like with the checking account. So the credit card you can think of is acting just like the checking account. You could connect it to the bank feed when you purchase things with the credit card. However, instead of decreasing the checking account, it will be increasing the liability. So if I go into this one, you can see that it's going to be going up in the liability direction with the expense forms and so on. And then we'll pay it off with some kind of, of payment uh, form, payment from the checking account form. So it might be a, a, a credit card payment form. So then I'm going to open that back up again. And then all of the other uh, current liabilities, liabilities that are going to be due within a year are into the category of other current liabilities because they don't have any special needs that are tied to them. No special sub ledgers that are tied to them. So here we have the, these are, these two happen to be the, the sales tax. Now you might think that sales tax has a special thing tied to it. And it kind of does because you use the sales tax widget, you know, to help you to record the sales tax. But the, I think the thing that requires the, the special category up top is when QuickBooks like restricts you from posting something to it. So I don't think you're restricted to make a journal entry to the sales tax uh, account or anything. So therefore it's still an other current liability. Sales tax, of course, as we have seen, will go up when we make sales invoices and sales receipts are the forms we make sales with and then go down when we have a sales tax payment going back then we have the loans now loans uh this is the long-term liability if you have a loan then it could be either short-term or a long-term loan meaning if it's due within a year it would be short term if it's due longer than a year it would be long term oftentimes you have both a short term and long term portion to the loan because you might have a loan that's going to be you know paid off in 10 years similar to like a mortgage type loan and in that case you're going to be paying it monthly if it's an installment loan and therefore the amount of the loan principal that's due within a year would be short term and the amount that is due after that year would be long term. So that gets a little bit messy, a little bit confusing. That's kind of a, a something that if you're a small business, you definitely you can't you, you, you might not need to do that unless you're doing external reporting purposes, although it's good information for internal reporting. Because if you're doing it just for taxes, you really just need the income statement, right? You need the profit and loss to do the taxes. Uh, but if you're going to, if you have to have the reporting for external uses, then 
Uh, you might have to do it on an accrual-based method, and therefore what you should do periodically is, is adjust the long-term, short-term and long-term portion of the loan in accordance with the amortization table. And so we'll talk about how to do that as we go through our uh, practice problem. And then we've got the equity, which once again is often the most confusing section, noting that equity simply just means it's going to be the assets minus the liabilities, right? Assets minus uh, the liabilities is going to be the equity section, or this is what we have. This is what is claimed by third parties that we've made a commitment to that they have a claim to. And then this is what should be ours, which in this case is negative. So that's not good. But if I open this up, then we have opening balance equity within it. Now, opening balance equity is actually an account that is a, a setup kind of account, helps you to enter the beginning balances into the system, as we will see when we start a new company file in a future course or section. It's not something you actually really want to balance in because it looks kind of unprofessional. This is a plug account. This is an account that QuickBooks just dumps money in when you're doing the setup process. So it's not really exactly a proper naming of something. So really what you want to do is take it out of opening balance equity when you first set up the company file and put it somewhere else and then never use opening balance equity again. <laughs> but uh, and then the retained earnings also a little bit strange of an account because many users of QuickBooks are going to be sole proprietorships and partnerships, possibly not uh, corporations, although they could be corporations and S corporations as well. If you're a sole proprietor, then you're not going to call it retained earnings, right? You're going to, you might just call it owner's equity or the owner's capital account. If you're a partnership, you're going to have multiple uh, capital accounts per partner. So this retained earnings account represents the, the, the money that is going to flow through within QuickBooks. So we can't really delete the retained earnings account. You can only rename it because this account is a special account that has special uses to it in that the net income from the income statement is going to roll into it. So if you're a sole proprietorship, you might want to find the retained earnings account and just rename it to, you know, an owner's equity account or something like that. If, if you prefer that, that name, because retained earnings indicates that it's going to be a corporation. And then in a corporation, you've got the retained, the retained earnings. So, and then you've got the net income. This is also a little bit wonky because normally in external reporting, we don't put net income oftentimes on the balance sheet uh, because it's going to be on the income statement. This isn't actually its own like account. It's basically QuickBooks trying to tie in the income statement to the balance sheet. It actually causes some problems sometimes when you're trying to allocate the net income to the to the different partners. So for example, if I go over to the income statement, here's the profit and loss, the bottom line of it is 1,676.46. If I go to the balance sheet, we could see there's the 1,676.46. So it just pulled in that amount. Now, again, why is it a little bit weird? Well, what if I like if I changed the date range up top and I said this was just one month, 110123, then it doesn't change it doesn't change this number. And if I change the income statement over here, you would think if I just wanted one month, 110123, then my net income for that one month would only be would only be 1,121. 87. So you would think that maybe it would it would roll in or do the closing process to retained earnings for the other months and give you one month. It doesn't because it just does it on a year by year basis. So that's one thing that's a little bit a little bit weird. So you just have to remember that that this net income is just going to always be on a yearly rollover closing basis. That's how QuickBooks does it, right? And then if I go to the next year, so let's say I, I go up one day uh, let's say I go from uh, uh, 12, 31, uh, let's go from 01, 01, 01, 24 to 01, 01, 24 and run that. Now it has moved, it has moved the net income that was here into here. So now it's in retained earnings. So what does retained earnings mean then? It's the earnings that have accumulated from the business so you've got earnings, which 
by hopefully increased your cash as well as your assets, right? Your, your income has been made over expenses. And instead of paying that money out to the owner, you have retained them. So it's earnings not over one year. That's what the income statement is. The income statement shows you the income over a time period. The retained earnings shows you all of the income over the entire life of the business, which has not yet been distributed out to the owner. Now, how do you distribute the retained earnings out to the owner? Well, in a sole proprietorship, we would call that draws. So you'd have a draws account, which would be decreasing the equity as you draw the money out. For a partnership, you would have a draws account for each uh, partner. You'd have a capital account and a draws account for each partner. And for a corporation, we call them dividends. Dividends are like draws in that we're taking the money that has been accumulated and we're distributing it out to the owners. The problem with a corporation, however, is that like you might own stock in Apple as a shareholder of that publicly traded company, but you can't go over there and say, give me a dividend as one owner of the company because the stocks have to all be the same. So when you say there's a, when you say there's a dividend for a corporation, you have to agree on the dividend and then all the shares of the corporation have to be attributed the same amount of the dividend. Not true for a partnership, because that'll be in agree in accordance with the partnership agreement. So you could have different partners taking out different money of the business in a partnership, which is confusing from that's why the partnership is actually more difficult some, in some ways in a lot of ways for the bookkeeping side of things. Now the other problem here is if I go in if I go from 010123123123 and I look down here, notice that this net income is not an account. I can't do a journal entry to that net income. So if I was a partnership, then I might have like three partners here that, that all have different capital accounts. And when I want to report my, my information, I would like to take this net income and distribute it according to the partnership agreement to the revenue sharing agreement between the three partners. But again, I, I can't really get rid of this account here. So that's why also that, that this net income can be a little bit messy in, in that in that regard. Most online softwares do the same thing. So if you're a partnership, you're just gonna have to work around, you're just gonna have to basically work around that, right? You, that net income, you can't like remove <laughs> the net, you can't like journal entry the net income that's in the balance sheet out to the partners. Uh, so that's just something to be aware of. But uh, that's the major form for the balance sheet. For external reporting purposes, note that it's pretty nice. It's a pretty nice balance sheet, but you might also, uh, if you wanted to adjust it, you can have the summary balance sheet, which will basically give you, let me just show that real quick. If I go into the summary balance sheet, I think it's balance sheet, balance sheet summary. Uh, then this balance sheet, let's go from 010123 tab 123123 has all of the all of the accounts. See, now I have current assets and then all the bank accounts are within here, which is kind of similar to cash and cash equivalents and accounts receivable has one account. So this one actually might be better in some ways for external reporting purposes or at least as the starting document for external reporting because you don't have these subcategories for the bank accounts which might which might not be necessary for like external reporting needs. You don't usually use the summary balance sheet for internal reporting needs however because I can't expand on these accounts and I would like to because oftentimes I would like to go into the checking account detail here to see what has happened within it. So that's the general overview. We'll go into some more uh, reporting because we could then start from this balance sheet and make a whole lot of different reports from it, such as comparative reports. We can use a vertical analysis like percentages uh, within it as well. And we, we'll start to see how we can do that with the tools up top and the principles that we apply to adjust reports will be similar on the balance sheet and other reports as well, although there will be a difference between reports that are as of a point in time, balance sheet, one date, 
and those that are time frame oriented like the income statement.